Hi. Oh, y'all are gonna see all this, huh? Okay, <laughs> so that's the kind of video we're doing today. Here, <laughs> is that your bench? That's a nice bench. <laughs> Tell me that, that's actually a really nice bench. I don't know, don't listen to me. Vest on, vest off. This is gonna bother some people that have OCD. I'm probably not right in the middle and I'm probably not recording right in the middle, so sorry. <laughs> Hola and hello, welcome back to Talks with Tally. God bless you all, I'm so happy to have you here and I'm so excited to be doing this video. I'm so excited to be outside. It's fall time already, so you already know that my sinuses already started kicking in, so I sound a little congested. I'm getting over a little sinus uh, infection, I believe it is, so I apologize in advance. Uh, I'm really, really excited because right now, right in front of me right now, if I can get in a view of the beautiful beach in front of me right now, um, I will in a minute, but it's literally, it's stunning outside. And the view that I have right now is just so beautiful and I'm so happy to be in the park and I'm happy to be outside. I'm very excited to share the word that I have for you guys today. And I hope it's one that's gonna be a blessing to your life. Grab your tissues and be ready to be triggered. All right, so y'all are going to have to get ready because this one is pretty long. And I will say, it's not gonna be easy to talk about. And I hope I don't cry. <laughs> this word is going to be a reminder for you that today is the day that you become healed. The day that you become cleaned and you become healed and you sin no more. It's time to for real let go and give it to God. For real this time. You may have thought you did it before, but you really fully haven't yet. And I need you to come to terms with that realization, with that reality. Because you might have thought that you really let it go and you've healed from it, yet you're still reacting to it when you get triggered as if it's still fresh. Let's get ready for it, y'all. This is episode 12 of Talks with Tally, and this title for this message is prepare for trigger exposure. Ooh, Lord. We're going to pray really quick first and then we're going to get into it. Father God, Lord, I come before you in this moment, Lord, asking you that it be you, Lord, speaking today. When I'm presenting this word that you've given me, Lord, and I want to place it in your hands, Lord, I want to place it, Lord, in front of you, Lord, so you can, Lord, refine it, make it be whatever it is that you want it to be, Lord, remove whatever it is that is not yours, Lord, and I ask that it be you, Lord, speaking, Father God, and putting a filter in front of my mouth, Lord, that anybody that hears this word today, Lord, be made new today. That, Lord, that they, when they hear this word, Lord, that they not leave the same, that there's transformation, Lord, that there's liberation, that there is cleaning, that there is healing, Lord, and that you make them new. Restore them, Lord, and let it be you, Father God, touching their lives in a way that's undeniable and unshakable. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen, amen. The sun wanted to shine today. Hello. Hi. Hello. Thank you, Lord. So I want to begin by asking you all a question. And y'all ain't going to like me, okay? But it's because we really do, the Lord needs to pick out and refine and use a little tweezer to be able to get out the things that he needs to get out from you. And the question is this, how many times have you seen the same lesson brought to you over and over and over again, yet you have always ignored it? I'll see myself out now. <laughs> Today, you are reminded that the one who fights for you requires for you to be set free, to be clean, to be healed, and to keep it pushing. Stop being like Lot's wife and staying in the past. Today, he reminds you of who he is and what he does. So actually for this word today, I've been reading and reflecting upon a book that I'm reading for a Bible Girls and Dates Nights um, group that I'm a part of, and it's The Woman Thou Art Loosed by T.D. Jakes. And I have been assigned a chapter in that book to reflect upon for the group. And this chapter has actually kind of sparked what we're gonna talk about in this word today. Um, and it's actually gonna be used kind of like as a resource, obviously, other than the word. I think it was a nice little framework to talk about. A trigger, when we talk about a social trigger, right, or an emotional trigger, it's something that is released, it is set off, right? Or initiated by something. And this could be like an alarm or a gun. Basically, it is a cause that then therefore has a reaction. And so as I'm reading in this book that, I'm ta that I was talking about, previously in chapter two it is titled broken arrows and this chapter specifically talks about like rejection and, and abuse of children and how children really are the what he likes to call epistles which are basically like letters written to the future 
from the past and how we need to be taking care of the children and that we have to be aware of what trauma in the past can truly do to someone and bring it with them into their future and whatnot. In Psalms 127, three to five. If you see me looking down a lot, it's because I don't have a table in front of me today. It's okay, God gave me two legs and that's a blessing, amen. So Psalms 125, three to five, I'm reading NIV. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. So in case you didn't know, a quiver is actually the container in which someone you know, I don't know, arrowist. I forgot what the word is. I don't know. Um, someone that shoots arrows. I don't, there's a word for it. But the quiver is basically the container that you hold the arrows in before you pick it up and actually put it into the bow to shoot it. One thing I loved about this verse was that it says that arrows, right, being the children, being the fruit that is produced by someone. So like what we produce, we as children of God, what we are, who we become, and what is produced from this walk. Those fruits and that produce and that offspring, whatever you want to call it, in that man's hands will speak for him and it will defend defend him. They will defend him in front of their accusers. Meaning when someone is giving a false witness of you, right? When someone is lying about you, when someone is accusing you of things that you didn't do, or they don't truly know you, so they make up something, your fruits will tell on you, like the previous word that God had given me. And this also goes with us as people. The results of our traumas and the results of our past actually will be a showing, a telling, an exhi exhibition of the things that we have been through and what we've done with those things. So this word is also a, rem a reminder that God is your defense. His word says that he will place a table for us in front of our enemies. I always say this when I meet somebody new and, you know, maybe somebody is hesitant of making new friends or whatever it is, and I don't want to ever push anybody. God said that he will put the people around me that are necessary to be around me and take away the ones that are not. I always say this thing that my mom always says, and it's, God will give testimony about me. I don't have to speak for myself because God will do it for me. So therefore, when there are those people that they talk bad about you, they talk down about you, they kick you when you're down or they judge you, especially when they don't even know any better or they just judge the outside appearance. Understand that God defends you. And his word says that even if a thousand fall or even if 10,000 fall at your side, they will not touch you. They will not get to you. So therefore we are expecting persecution. That's, that's normal on this walk. Psalms 105.15, it says, do not touch my chosen people. But there are also things that we have to be accountable for in this walk and in this life, you know? A lot of it also has to do with the fact that God isn't blaming you for the things that you went through, but he will hold you into account and make sure that you take accountability for what you do with what was done and what you've been through and what have you made from it. Proverbs 4, 20 to 23, it says, my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. This is a heart matter that we're talking about today, y'all. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's body. Whole body, actually, it says. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. T.D. Jake says in his book that children are living epistles. Remember when I mentioned that earlier? That should stand as evidence to the future that the past has made some level of contribution. And this could be good and bad contribution. But what you choose, like I said, to do with that contribution is what stays as a result. And as for God's plans, this is his plan for those contributions. Jeremiah 29, 11. Yeah, we got lots of word here today. Jeremiah 29, 11, what does it say? It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So you know what that means? It means that even if that trauma caused you to feel like you don't have a future, that you don't have any hope, that you don't have any reassurance, that you're not going to be anything, that you're not going to amount to anything. He says, I actually plan the total opposite. So which one of those things, that person that hurt you, those things that hurt you, that trauma that hurt you, or me? Which one are you going to believe? My God. What I want us to focus on is that the children, right, in this word, this could be anybody. We were all tr children once, right? But even now as adults too, children can be any of us because we are all God's children and children go where their parents aim them. Woo. So let me also add that obviously as adults, we can get hurt too. Some of us may have spiritual parents like our pastors or leaders or mentors or just people that we looked up to at some point, whether it was in this walk or outside of it, that a lot of the times they have taken advantage of our innocence, whether it be the innocence of our youth or, uh, or the innocence of our bodies or whether it be our trust or our naivety, I think is the word, being naive or our purity in our hearts and believing that everybody is good. 
everybody's a good person because I think everybody probably thinks like me. Well, as we all know, that's not really true, unfortunately. And sometimes that can be a really painful and harsh reality to face. My gosh, this hair. Lord. So when it talks about the arrows, right, when in the book, he breaks it down and there's three components that we want to discuss here. It talks about the arrow itself, which is the children, right, which is us, the children of God. And then there's the bow. Mm. This is what propels the arrow. My God. And this could be a parent, a, a spiritual parent, a leader, pastors, or brothers and sisters in the community, whatever it may be that I already addressed. And the quiver, as I said before, is the container that actually holds the arrows. So this would be the place that it's being carried in. Mm. My God. So this is where they are held together. So this could be like the house, the church, your environment. But I also want you to remember a key component also that is actually additional here that I'm going to add to T.D. Jakes' book. The person holding all of these things. There's a bonus person shooting the arrow. An arrow cannot shoot itself, okay? So us as people, we can't produce something from nothing because even the negative sparks something in us, right? And at some point we have encountered someone that has left an effect on us. And even in the book, he says, I am a shot arrow. Oh God, let me hit my target. But what if I told you that some don't even make it past the bow because even if they have that spark in them that makes them want to move that makes them want to go forward that person with that thing in trauma that past in history is still holding on to them Woo, my gosh and some of us don't know how to be set free and some of us do know how yet we choose to stay there and some are stuck because they have their work cut out for them before they even begin they're stuck in the dry hands that are handling them with selfishness and jealousy and pride and envy and confusion and human hands that don't know god therefore don't know how to treat them properly because i'm sorry if you don't see someone how god sees them then probably aren't treating them exactly how God would want you to treat them. Hello. Some people are out there. They're left in these churches, inoperant, stuck, heating benches. Or if they're working and serving in churches, they're working in dysfunction because they're not doing what God has called them to do. So you may be in dysfunction. You're functioning, but you're not functioning how he has called you to. And then some also are rooted in lack of word. There are people that they don't have word where they are. And no matter how much you look for the Lord in your own home. You can be fed spiritually in your own home <laughs> abundantly. But if your spiritual home, there is no root nor, nor foundation of the word of God. It is a soil that can't produce. So if you can't produce, you die. My God. God's word. You know what God's word does? God's word is the key that opens the door for us to feel his presence, to be able to surrender to it. Because the thing is, his presence is always there. But sometimes we ignore him. And sometimes we like to choose pain over him the difference is you know what's so crazy to me is that if anything we choose pain over him yet he chose pain for us my god with his own pain he made a transaction to pay a debt our debt mind you to save us from the jail and bail us out because of abuse and trauma and church hurt broken relationships as a result many of us will feed into and become inundated with rejection as our identity, lost as our identity, broken as our identity. And because we have all of that nothing, we seek external factors, miscellaneous items to be able to be our identity. Drugs, alcohol, sex, clothes, money, untrust in the opposite sex, addiction to things. I saw someone say once, a preacher saying that addicts are the best worshipers, but it's because they know how to worship. They're professional worshipers. Their worship has just been misplaced. Mm. And this is a problem that we have to face today. We have been putting our trauma on pedestals and worshiping our trauma. Oh my gosh. Our diagnoses, our pasts, what could have been. We run from a lot of the triggers that we actually need to overcome and face already. And this is not for everyone. You know, this is for those those who know, know, okay? This isn't just a blanket statement of what I'm saying. It says in the book, too, that he says, Jesus didn't come and console what needed to be rebuked, what needed to be set free. <laughs> so, therefore, your treatment is going to be based on the infirmity that you have, the illness that you have. My God. Second Timothy 1, 7, it says, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid or fearful, okay? But gives us power, love, and self-discipline. In other words, it also says sound mind. I'm going to be honest with you guys, and I'm going to talk about a little topic that might be a little bit triggering for some people, but I'm perfectly okay with it. I was essayed as a child, okay? I was abused in that manner. And I have to be honest with you, you know what's so crazy? This word kind of came about when I was thinking about my testimony, and 
I ended up seeing my abuser not only a couple of times in the years that it occurred during my abuse, but I also ended up having to see them twice more in my adult life, years, years later. And mind you, the second occurrence that I saw the person, it was when I was 16 and then when I was, I think, 24, okay? So that same thing had to keep coming about for me to learn from it and heal from it. My God. And mind you, that third time I had to see that person, I was at work in a healthcare setting. And so I couldn't react in the way that I needed to react for my own sanity. But this taught me that there are many, many times, and not obviously in this extreme scenario, but there's lots of other things that we will see, lessons that we will see numerous times, okay? People that we will encounter numerous times with characteristics that we have to see various times in our life that serve a purpose and a lesson for us to learn. And if we don't, and we keep on ignoring it and running from it, we're never going to learn it. And it's literally like we're ignoring the correction, the discipline, and the growth that God wants to give us, the healing that he wants to give us. We're ignoring it. And I'm glad to say that God has healed me to the point that I literally have prayed for that person multiple times, actually, so they could get saved and come to the feet of Christ. That if God were to actually put them in front of me right now, I would literally put hands. <laughs> And not like that. But I would give them the prayer for the salvation. The prayer to accept Jesus Christ as their savior. I can say that confidently, wholeheartedly. I can say that right now and be like, let's go. Let's do it. Another one for Christ. And maybe that makes me crazy. Some people might think that like, this girl is whacked out. Something is up with her brain. She's not okay. And all these other things. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely, I believe 110% in boundaries. I'm also a child of God that believes that God performs miracles still to this day. And that's stuff that we have to see more often is seeing the power and who he is and what he can do. And like I said, there's sometimes that we need to be triggered and exposed to our triggers multiple times and to learn that lesson. And that was what forgiveness was for me. God needed that foundation of understanding what forgiveness was to be in me so I could understand what he did for me and the power of his love for me. You know how many times I, th oh my God, you know how many times I think about it? I think about it all the time. And it, and it honestly, that thought just makes me, whew. Whoa, you know, Jesus could have came when I was still lost in the world, when I was gone. God could have chosen to not forgive me just because he's God and just because he can. But he said, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. He was my missing piece. He, could, he still is that missing piece. And I'm just so thankful that he's a part of the puzzle now because he forgives all who believe in him, in the son of God because through that we shall not perish but have everlasting life john 3 16. check it out so something i have learned in this walk is that you need to prepare to be triggered mm, it's biblical actually hold on i'll show you we need to sometimes be triggered over and over and over to be healed because there's times where god has to slowly rip away how you react to certain things how you get angry so quickly, how you judge people, how you approach them with annoyance rather than compassion and understanding. Listen, I'm gonna tell you right now, this walk, <laughs> being healed, it will take a breaking period, especially of the things that you have gotten used to that make you feel like you're okay, even though you're not. That whole thinking that you're better than others because you don't do what they do. <laughs> please, please, let me, let me ask you a question here. All right, because this is something that made me truly angry in the spirit. But honestly, it's because it's something that caused anger within myself when I examined myself, okay? Let me ask you, where were you when you spat in God's face? Yet when the devil came to take your life, God still covered you. That night, he still covered you. He still picked you up by his mighty hand from that car, from that bed, from that party, from that accident, from that house. He had his hand on you while your spit dried up on his face. If you do not face your triggers and overcome them, you will die to them because one of you has to win. One of you will overcome the other. And when I say this, I, I truly mean this. You know why? Because it's also a part of my testimony. I did this and I and this is what happens to many. So this is not even something that I'm just saying I'm pulling it out of my butt right now. OK, this is truly what people go through. You think that there, there wasn't people in the Bible that had to face their triggers a couple of times? do things that they didn't want to do, do things that caused them pain, do things that caused them anger that they didn't want to do. They had to go against their own feelings to do what God has told them to do in order for them to get to where God wanted them to go and be who God wanted them to be. Holding on to this trauma, holding on to this, all it does is result in this. Ready? I'm going to read it to you. This is what I wrote because these are the things that I felt, okay? It only results in insecurity and anger, not allowing people to help you or to love you, people paying for the debt of others, 
You make them pay for what somebody else did to you. You're constantly needing reassurance because if you just promise once, it holds no weight for me. For someone like me, if you would just say it once, I won't trust your word. I don't care how many times you've actually shown me that you're trustworthy, I can't just hear it once. One is not enough to build hope in me that I can trust. I was reading this book and I realized I still had something that he had to work on in me. Because I'm gonna tell you right now, I grew up very religious. And that type of mentality, that legalism, religious mindset, all it does is teach you that works is what saves you. Works is what causes God to love you more. Mm, let me tell you something. Works is not what gets you into heaven. It's grace. Imagine God now bringing me to this walk, right? He's teaching me that it has nothing to do with that. It's just by grace and by grace alone and his love for me and his mercy for me that he was able to do this. So add that mindset on top of my trauma in my relationships. Whew, toxic. I literally am God's toxic girlfriend like that's, that's literally watch ready I'll show you how when I had felt like trash and I felt rejected and I felt undervalued by those relationships it truly was religious mindset plus my trauma it was the perfect formula the perfect concoction for me to drink my own bottle of poison that now it's easier for me and I prefer to have a works-based relationship <laughs> with everyone because at least ooh, and I know somebody's gonna be able to relate to this at least if I worked for it and I excelled and I overachieved in it it made me feel myself as if I was worthy of love and kindness and respect and being valued because at least this time I knew that this person would have a reason to love me and if they didn't then it had something to do with them being wrong something was wrong with them not me because there was reasons to love me but they were all stuff that I could just make up and do on my own. These are just works that I could do. And my works that I could do were the reasons that people can love me. It wasn't because of who I was. It's because I was able to provide something. It was something kind of like a shiny metal for me. My acts, my, well, my, my works, all these actions that I can perform. I truly felt like I was like a doll on a shelf and I had like a little shiny metal around my neck. Pick me. And I think about it, oh my gosh, it breaks my heart. I do this, so I deserve this. Do you not hear the sound of how much lack that has? I have to make something because I felt like nothing. Oh my gosh, Lord. So I, I always felt myself having this need, not a want to achieve things. No, I felt a need to overachieve in all these things and to prove myself to everybody including myself, when nobody around me, nobody that really cared about me, cared about any of that stuff. And mind you, the ones that didn't love me, that never loved me, they would have never cared about the stuff in the first place anyways. They would have never cared anyway. And you know what's so horrible about it all is the fact that I started to do this with God. When I start to get lazier, I start to feel spiritually heavy. When I start to experience spiritual attacks, the easier way to go is to lead a life in a relationship with God that's solely based on works because works are so much easier than true, in-depth, genuine, from the heart connection with God or with anybody in a relationship. He ripped me out of bed the other night, okay? He ripped me out of bed in the middle of the night and he showed me this is why I sometimes revert to those things and revert to doing that in our relationship between me and him. And you know what is so sad about it is that he had to be the one that reminded me. I am not them. <laughs> I don't just pity you, Natalia. You're not a charity case for me. I already love you the most, and I have always loved you first. I discovered that night the only thing that God can't do. There's only one thing that God can't, and I would never even utter those words out of my mouth that God can't. The only thing that God can't do is love us more than he does. And that means that I can't by any means, nor do I have to try or nor do I have to show certain things for him to love me as a response, nor for him to actually love me more. I saw it as brownie points. Okay, if I do this, that means that God loves me a moderate amount today. If I don't do this, that means he loves me less today. If I do this and I have a really on fire day with him, that means he loves me the most today. He's always been consistent. Even when we're unstable. <laughs> We're so unstable. I noticed it too. Like when it happens, I, when I start to get spiritually tired, I, send, I, I start realizing I'm like, I'm like talking in my head with him. Like, oh God, did you see? I'm trying. I'm trying today. I, di I, didn't, I didn't react out of anger. I did compassion instead. Or God, I, I got up early today. Or God, I, I fasted today. Or God, I, I read for two hours today. I hope you noticed, Lord. And it was never a prideful thing. I never came to God with pride about these things. It was more so just, God, please see my efforts. 
please don't forget me. Please don't stop loving me out of nowhere. Please don't leave me out of, out of nowhere. Because I had abandonment issues so bad where people would get up just one day and just, I don't love you no more. Bye. And abandon me. And it didn't affect him at all. It was truly no, what is it? No crumbs off their back, whatever it was. It literally did not affect them whatsoever. It's like they lost nothing. So when someone treats you as if they lost nothing, when they choose to leave you and they react as if it is nothing to them, that's all you can feel like is nothing, especially when you've had your innocence ripped from you. This is the thing. The beautiful thing about our God is that when he says something, he does. He shouldn't have to reaffirm it to you. His word is promised and it's certain, but here's the thing. God is so beautiful. He knows us. He knows how we had to heal and he knows that sometimes we need to hear things more than once. So he will say things multiple times. He says so many things in the word so many times, so many different ways that mean the same thing. And that's what happens. You know how many times I've, I, I always say I'm a words of affirmation type of girl. I do the same thing with God. I always need reaffirmations all the time. <laughs> but how beautiful is it that he never stopped loving you? And that he never left like they did. And that way he said he was going to do, he's going to do it from the beginning. Thank God I'm good now. Like if God gives me a word, I'm like, bet I'm holding on to it, Lord. You said it, you're going to do it. And now actually what I do is <laughs> instead of just asking him to repeat the same thing, just to make sure I heard you the first time, Lord, I actually just hold on to that thing. And I keep reminding him, God, God, remember what you said? <laughs> The book continues and it speaks about splintered arrows. What's so beautiful about this, right, that I, we're almost done by the way. He speaks about splintered arrows. So they're not just broken arrows. Some of them are just splintered, all right? And this is kind of what the Lord placed on my heart when it came to this topic. Splintered arrows, if you think about splinters, they are things that stick out. They're little attachments or not even attachments. They're really parts of that arrow that have been chipped off and broken or torn, but not fully have been fully removed or cut off from the arrow, right? And so it's sticking out of the arrow. This is really powerful, right? When we look at splintered arrows, right? When we look at something that is splintered, ooh, and it has those spikes sticking out of it, there is no oneness in that arrow. There is no unity in that arrow because there's no such thing as some unity. It's either all or none. Oh my God, we're not gonna get into it. Anyways, if there's no unity, if there's no uniformity in this arrow, it is no longer one, but it is one plus, okay? A bunch of attachments and then what it causes is when we have those splinters on us that leave us tainted like that, leave us with stuff on our sleeve, there is a division in the house that is me. Woo! my God. And what does the word say? It says that a house divided shall not stand. Oh my God. I was thinking about it too. And I thought of splinters right now. I don't know where this is just straight. I'm, I'm going to say it just came from the Lord because sometimes he'll just drop pictures in my head and it's just like, whoa. I was thinking about how some runners and swimmers, right? They actually have hairs on their legs, right? That they actually have to shave off for um, swim meets, races, whatever it may be. And it's because due to physics, okay? Physics says that when people have hair sticking out, what we can kind of assimilate and symbolize as the attachments or I mean the splinters actually I don't know why I keep on saying attachments but they kind of are because they're not really a part of you but they're things I want to see latched to you oh my god physics shows that hair hairs on the legs of swimmers and, and and runners it actually shows it actually slows them down it drags them backwards Woo and that person has to fight extra hard with extra force to be able to reach where they want to go and how they want to get there in order to reach the same place that other people that don't have it get to or go further. They say it's best and they suggest that you shave it off, cut it off, therefore let it go. Are you getting the symbolism here? And this is so that there's nothing in the way Oh my gosh. So that it slips right off you. The water, it slips right off of the legs of the swimmers. The air can pass right through without any type of obstacle or boundary or wall in its place. So it's time. It's time to over overcome and, and cut off and shave off those triggers and the things that you're holding on to. So you can run this race at your best, pa fastest pace. Thorns, because they kind of resemble thorns. They are projections that are found significantly usually on defensive plants. They are a mechanism of defense. They are a mechanism of not letting someone in. My God. And mind you, they hurt others before they can come and hurt you, before you let them get to you, before you let them hurt you, before you get let them touch you. And so with these splinters that we're refusing to let go of and we're refusing to cut off, what it's doing is it's causing a delay in this walk. It's causing it a delay in the closeness with the Lord. It's causing a delay in your healing. It's causing a delay in your liberation and your cleaning because there's a process of this, there's the, the liberation, there's the cleaning, and then there's the healing. So what if I told you that you holding on to these things, this trauma, these triggers, 
allowing them to still have power over you and not putting them at the feet of Christ and fully surrendering them to him? What if I told you that was causing a delay in your walk, therefore a delay in your obedience to God? And what is delayed obedience? It's still disobedience. So what is the treatment for these triggers? What is the treatment for these things? It is the act of creating sensitivity tolerance. That's one of the first things that we need to do. Sensitivity tolerance is basically when a memory that refers to one of those triggers, when we become exposed to it and we get that sensitivity tolerance, it means that we're able to, when we're faced with that memory or that thing or that trauma, that past, that hurt, whatever it is, every time that we see it, there is a decrease Ooh. decrease in the strength of a response to a stimulus induced by past experiences with the same or related stimuli and you're probably thinking to yourself um where in the bible does somebody actually have to get triggered over and over natalia only one example hagar in genesis 16 go read the story i'm not gonna tell you hagar had to go back to sarah the person that had been talking to her some type of way that never really liked her probably because she slept with her man even though that was sarah's decision and it's a little messy it's a messy story oh my gosh there's so many messy stories in the bible i'm like dang this is crazy y'all if that was me nowadays the Lord knows why he didn't make me in biblical times because it would be bad, but it was messy. But Hagar had to go back to Sarah, knowing well that Abraham did not love Ishmael the way that he did Isaac, knowing that his son and her were not valued the way that they should have been. God told her, you need to go back to the place that you were serving. You need to go back. You need to learn. You need to be processed. You need to face that thing. You need to receive your blessing at the end of it. But in this walk, we cannot skip steps in the process. We can't skip the process. What? What makes you think that you're better than somebody else to skip the process? That's literally like, like me accepting Christ, coming to this walk and not changing anything about me, yet still saying, I still deserve to go to heaven. And again, it doesn't have to do with our works, but God made a command and it was for so whoever believed in his son, right? There's a difference, and I've said it in a previous word, there's a difference between being a fan and a follower. And if you're going to be a believer in Jesus, you need to be a follower as well. You can't just say something with your mouth and then your actions don't back it up. I don't know why this is getting aggressive. I need to relax. Just like Hagar, I'm going to need you across this screen right now to prepare yourself to have to talk to people that don't like you, that maybe you don't like, to the ones that hurt you, to the ones that dragged your name in the mud. Prepare to serve them because Jesus didn't come down here to get served. He came down here to serve. Oh my God. What makes you think that you'd be better than Jesus? Prepare to be the saving grace to the one that would have never reached out a hand for you if you were in a burning fire. If you want to be like Jesus and if you want to heal, you need to start practicing compassion. And I'm not saying that having compassion means that you need to be a rug, FYI. Okay. But once you create the sensitivity tolerance to your triggers and you're able to cut it off, let it go, completely surrender it to the Lord, when your reaction changes, okay, and the noises in your mind begin to minimize, we are able to have clarity in the things that he wants us to do. Because it's not that God ever speaks unclearly because he speaks very clearly. But how much clutter and noise do you have in your mind that you haven't cleared up for you to be able to hear his voice the way that you're supposed to? Because if we say, God, give me clarity, speak to me clearly, Lord, as if he doesn't speak clearly, that's calling God an unclear God, that he leaves room for mistake. In this walk, he will continue to give us directions in our healing. And sometimes, yes, it is asking for forgiveness from someone that, or, and or doing uncomfortable things that make you feel like you're literally physically ripping open that wound slowly, torturously, and you're seeing it rip open in front of your eyes. But this time, the difference is that you are the cause. You have become your own trigger in that aspect. But here is a nice reminder. Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so just know, if you say you can't do something that God has told you to do, you just called God a liar. There are two things that you can do in the face of your triggers, and it is either you can let it take authority over you or you take authority over it. Joshua 1 9 what does it say have I not commanded you be strong and courageous because here's the thing courageous people think that courage has to do with not having fear and actually it's the complete opposite it's acting opposite to your fear while it is present do not be afraid do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go how beautiful and of course when I'm not talking to the ones that try and then they mess up and then they try again you're trying but you have to give it a genuine good shot because remember this isn't about you healing you it's about God healing you and I've noticed on this walk and in my life in general the more that you have knowledge about something and exposure to something 
whatever it may be, it loosens the grip of the fear that it has on you and the unknown that it has on you because now you hold the power. Now you know too much to be taken blindsidedly. So today, I am declaring over your life in this moment, lift your hands where you are. I am declaring healing upon your life in Jesus' mighty name. Wherever you may be, whoever you are, I declare healing in your life in Jesus' mighty name. His word says so. And so may we prophesy it, Lord, in Jesus' name right now. Open your mouth and say, I am healed in Jesus' name because he said so. By his stripes, we are healed. Lord, his word says so numerous times, okay? Remember how many times God affirms us, yet he doesn't need to? His word says it. It says, Psalm 147.3, it says, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Psalm 32, it says, Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me in the past tense. My God, thank you, Lord. Isaiah 40.29, it says, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak my lord jeremiah 30 17 it says for i will restore health unto you and i will heal you of your wounds said the lord and lastly i'm going to put it here the lord's promise as a result of you allowing yourself to expose yourself to your triggers and allow him open the door for him to enter your heart and heal you the result of this and your actions and your choices and your decisions in this moment it's okay to be in pain it's okay to hurt okay because I know it's it's a tough word and I'm saying overcome it and fight it and da, da 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 And some days it feels like you really can't and that's okay. But what I'm saying to you is don't let it win and don't stay down too long. The Lord's promise as a result of you letting him fully take control and surrendering it to him, opening that door and putting it at his feet and finally admitting with your voice out loud that God, I can't. For real, I can't. I need you to do it. Let me, let me also just add here. There may be times where God will require you to do it as an act of obedience for him to test how much do you truly trust him so if he said that you can't do it and he's directing you to do it that means that you can the lord's promise as a result of this is found in job 11 16 to 19 his word says as the last closing verse thank you lord jesus i will surely forget your trouble recalling it only as waters gone by you speaking of you across the screen you will surely forget your trouble recalling it only as waters gone by life will be brighter than noonday and darkness will become like morning you will be secure because there is hope you will look about you and take your rest in safety my god you will lie down with no one to make you afraid and many will court your favor amen god is so beautiful god is so good whatever you have today that is in your heart that you need healing from that you need cleaning from because remember cleaning and healing are two different things and if you want me to talk about that just let me know in the comments below but you can find it in matthew chapter 8 um at the beginning there there's a story of a centurion man and then the one right before it i believe um where it talks about how the lord cleaned someone and then he healed someone. There's a difference between being cleaned and then there's a difference between being healed. You can't cover up a wound that hasn't been cleaned out because all that's gonna do is cause the infection to fester, the bacteria to fester, the wound and the drainage to fester. You need to have a cleaning first. But in order to have a cleaning, you need to have a liberation. Therefore, that needs to have an open door. There's a process to these things and how they do these things. There needs to be a liberation. There has to be an open door first, a broken chain first. Then there has to be a cleaning out of those things. And then there has to be a healing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. May we be able to operate, Lord, in the way that you have called us to, Lord. I'm gonna pray us out, guys. Father God, Lord, I ask you in this moment, Lord, for the person across the screen and under the sound of my voice in this moment, Father God, Lord, I ask that it be you, Lord God, breaking all the chains, Lord, in Jesus' name, Lord. You know the desires of their hearts, Lord, and you know the purposes that you have for their lives, Lord. And I ask you in this moment, Father God, that it be you, Lord, putting your hand on their lives, Lord, to be able to produce, Lord, exactly what it is that you want to produce in their life, Lord. I ask that it be you, Lord, breaking the chains, Lord, cleaning them, Lord, healing them, Lord, in Jesus' name. That it be you, Lord God, helping them, Lord, giving them the strength, Lord, and the will, letting them know, Lord, and giving them the security and knowing, Lord, who you are first and foremost, Lord, but also in who they are through you, Lord that they can do all things through you, Lord, who strengthens them, Lord, that they may be able to walk, Lord, in obedience, Lord, and overcome all the triggers, Lord, that are in their life from their past traumas. Lord, I ask that it be you, Lord, breaking any generational curses, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name right now in this moment, Father God. Lord, make them new today, Lord, that they not leave this message, Lord, until they are made new. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord, I ask that it be you, Lord, encountering them in a special way. Protect them, Lord. Heal them, Lord. Put your hand and we put them in your hand, Lord, because only you, Potter, the perfect Potter, the glorious almighty potter knows exactly what he needs to do for us. We give you all the glory, honor, and the credit and praise and worship, Father God, in this moment. Amen. Amen.
Guys, this walk is not easy. And sometimes you may think that he has healed something in you or that you have been healed of something and actually it was only a chip of the block. I need you to remember that there's going to be in this walk, because this is this walk, this run, whatever you want to call it, and Hebrews it talks about that you need endurance for this walk. Okay? You need endurance. We need endurance and we need character, okay? You are going to have to die every single day to yourself. You are going to have to forgive every single day. You're either yourself or other people. You're going to have to ask for forgiveness every single day. You're going to have to heal every single day. I kept on thinking at one point that in this walk, there was going to come a point where I was finally made perfect before I left this earth. Don't listen to me. I know that's stupid because we're only made perfect once Christ comes to pick up his church and we go to heaven, right? Once we leave these bodies. I need you to understand that Every single day, God is going to be, if you allow him to, only if you allow him to, he will be breaking things in you every day. He will be cleaning things in you every day. He will be setting you free every single day. He will be healing you every single day. You will be corrected every single day. You will be edified every single day. This is a journey. This is not a task to complete. This is not, I'm going to do this to get there or to get this. Lord, may we lose us, pieces of us, Lord, everything that is us, Lord, every single day, just so that there's more space for you in us, through us, and in our lives, Lord. He wants to heal you. He wants to save you. You just got to let him in and do it. If you want to know how, let me know. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in your heart today. Repent of your sins. Amen. Trust me, because I repented and saved my life. Thank you all for spending time with me, and I am going to see you guys in the next one.